So good afternoon and thank you so much for joining us today. Um, we are going to be talking about how you can harness the field of the health humanities when you are thinking about teaching health equity, whether it's at the undergrad level um, or the graduate med ed level or even in uh, continuing faculty development. Um, I'm Kamna Balhara. I'm one of the assistant program directors at Hopkins and one of the co-directors of Health Humanities at Hopkins Emergency Medicine. And I'm Nate Irvin. I'm also an uh, emergency medicine uh, physician and co-director of uh, H3M with Kamna. So um, we are going to start out with an interactive activity. Now that the doors are already closed, you guys can't run out of the room, so <laughs> you're stuck. Um, but we're going to engage in a common museum-based um, activity that's used in medical education. And normally we would potentially do this like in a gallery, you'd be walking around the museum with us, um, but because we can't do that, we're going to have a virtual gallery. Um, but before we start that, we just want to reiterate that there is no art, literature, history, expertise required whatsoever. This is just what your perspectives, what you're feeling today, this is just kind of all about your engagement with it and there are no right or wrong answers. And we'd love to have everyone participate, um, but certainly no one is obligated, um, no one is obligated to do so. So the activity that we're gonna do is called the personal responses tour. And as I said, uh, since we're not actually in a gallery, we have uh, curated sort of a virtual gallery for you. Um, so if you can go ahead and scan that QR code, or you can um, enter the URL that's there, and it'll take you to some, uh, something called a Padlet. And in this gallery, um, you'll see there's an area to add comments below every image that shows up in the gallery. And as you're looking through this gallery, we'd like for you to just think about what health equity means to you um, in your personal sphere, your professional practice, or both. And we would like you to choose one work of art that speaks to what health equity means to you. Um, and after you select that work of art, we'd like you to just spend a couple minutes um, kind of noticing what observations come to the surface. And below your chosen image, um, please share why you chose it, um, just so that as a group we can, we can kind of see each other's ideas. And it should show up as anonymous unless you have a Padlet account in case you're worried about who's going to see it. But feel free to sign it if you, if you want to know who wrote it. Um, and then when we come back in a couple minutes, we'll have an opportunity for a few people to share out loud. Um, so we'll regroup in just about a couple minutes. Okay, so um, for folks that are, are still looking or writing, feel free to, feel free to keep doing that. Um, but is there anyone who would like to share, outside, share out loud with the group what image they chose and, and why they chose it? Okay. So the, one of the birds, it looks like a bunch of us chose it. It made me think of an image that helped me understand the idea of equal versus equitable. People standing and trying to look over a fence, equal would be steps of the same size regardless of height, whereas equitable would be a taller than taller step for the shorter person. And this that just invoked that image for me, which is why I, I chose the birds. Right, so it, it reminded you of an image that you previously, is that the one of the people standing on boxes yeah. trying to watch the baseball game? Yeah. So it was something from your personal experience kind of yeah, connected yeah. with it. Did anyone else who chose the same image want to want to comment on why they chose it? Or would anyone else like to share a different image that they chose? What the, the eggshell? The mm -hmm. um, I didn't I didn't very strongly connect with it, but there, there was one aspect of it I connected with, which is I think um, taking care to um, engage families more uh, talking about social risk and, and uh, not stigmatizing, prioritizing the dignity uh, with those types of conversations and looking at the potential unintended you know, consequences of, of not doing it you know, correctly and, and having um, appropriate referrals and things like that and training set up before we actually have those conversations because certainly could lead to so you're talking about sort of getting prepared and being ready to sort of balance out multiple considerations before those conversations because dig dignity is important and there's something sort of precarious about the situation and not pushing it one way or the other. Thank you. Uh, I think we have time for a couple more comments if anyone wants to tell us what image they chose. I also chose this image.
Yeah, so for you, you saw sort of something fragmented and you thought of what's fallen through the cracks and you know what separates people who fall through the cracks versus those who are able to kind of exist whole within, within the system. Thanks. One more, one, time for one more. Yes, go ahead. I chose the, <clears throat> I think it's a train track. It just made me feel something. <laughs> but, but Perfect. I, I feel like it led me to think that, you know, you're giving everyone the same starting point. I'm looking at it like going that way rather than this way. So I thought it was the same starting point with an unknown destination, which might be scary when it comes to equity, but this one sort of spoke to me. Yeah, there's a lot of unknowns and a lot of sort of uncertainties in the process and a lot that makes people uncomfortable about the process too. So um, definitely a lot of different different ideas there. Um, I know that there were a lot of comments in the Padlet, so please take the time to read what others wrote, because it's always fascinating to see someone who picked the same image as you and they had a maybe totally different reaction or different connection with the image. Um, so what we did just now is called the Personal Responses Tour, and it's a really widely used um, museum-based pedagogical method that's frequently actually used in medical education. Um, and the idea is that you can not only explore your personal perspectives on a topic um, when you are sort of trying to explore where you are with that topic or what barriers or issues you face around it, but it also gives voice to others to be able to share their perspectives. And as we've heard, we sort of heard a lot of different, even in this brief conversation, we talked about definitions of equitable. Um, we talked about preparing for conversations. We talked about fragility. We talked about uncertainty in the process. Um, so a lot of themes that came up. So this is a really great way if you have a group of people that don't really know each other that well to get them all talking about the same topic because they're kind of coming at it indirectly through the lens of art. Um, or a great way to have conversations that are challenging or you know topics that are potentially controversial. This is a nice sort of indirect way to approach them. Um, and this is something you can even do virtually. We've with our group, we've our our residents have endured it over Zoom as well. So. Um, so yeah, thank you so much for, for participating and um, thanks so much for, for speaking up and, and sharing in the comments as well. So for today, um, we're gonna be describing how and why the health humanities represent an ideal scaffold for talking about health equity, regardless of um, the level of training that you're thinking about. And uh, we're gonna then share the process and the results from a curriculum implemented at our own institution. And then we'll talk about something called the PRISM model which is valuable when thinking about how to apply the humanities in medical education. And finally, we'll end with a, just like a brief activity to get you thinking about how you might be able to adapt some of these strategies for your own learners. So um, I know we talked about different approaches to health equity, but just to sort of get us with some shared language, uh, we achieve health equity when every person has the opportunity to attain their full health potential. Um, and to address long-standing inequities in health, the next generation of clinicians needs to not only understand the social context of care, uh, but also be able to challenge their own biases and their own assumptions. Um, inequities in health are propagated by broader systemic, social, political, historic forces that are not routinely emphasized in traditional medical education, and they're impacted by modifiable factors such as bias or cultural humility that are not traditionally targeted as competencies in medical education. So educators preparing trainees to advance health equity must look beyond traditional pillars of medical education and really start to think outside of the box in terms of what pedagogical frameworks we wanna apply. So that brings us to the humanities. So over the past few decades, there has been accumulating evidence that the arts and humanities are actually um, integral to medical education across the continuum of training, all the way from pre-medical education to continuing faculty development. So the National Academy of Sciences, Engineering, and, and Medicine issued a report in 2018 concluding that there's sufficient evidence already out there uh, to support the, um, the evaluation and integration of humanities courses in medical training. And so they kind of, um, I think we all have like a general feel of what the arts and humanities are, but they sort of tried to create a definition. And um, for them, the humanities were disciplines that you know we traditionally think of like history, ethics, philosophy, sociology, um, that teach us to read closely, that teach us to appreciate context, um, to understand social structures and relationships. And then the arts are essentially, you know, what we think of music, dance, et cetera, um, that teach creative means of expression and sort of ways to understand the human experience and express the human experience. Um, so after the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine put out that report, 
the Association of American Medical Colleges actually made the arts and humanities their focus for, for one of their primary educational focuses and um, dedicated a lot of funding and resources to this topic. And they actually commissioned and funded a very large scoping review of the arts and humanities uh, in medical education across North America. And they put out um, a monograph, their third monograph to date, that was entirely focused on the arts and humanities. And they concluded that the arts and humanities may be essential to ed educating um, this and the next generation's physician workforce, and that there's a unique and unrealized role for the arts and humanities in medical education. And their scoping review identified almost 800 articles um, describing the integration of the arts and humanities in health professions education. And um, from the scoping review, they actually developed an emerging theory of practice called the PRISM model, which we'll talk about shortly. But one of the four core functions of the humanities that they identified was um, actually social advocacy and critique. And so that's especially relevant to what we're talking about today in terms of health equity. Um, so why the health humanities uh, specifically and what are the health humanities? I think many of us have heard of the medical humanities where we think about like art and literature and apply it towards physician education. Um, but we would really encourage you to start to think about the health humanities, which I know it sounds kind of like semantic, but there, there truly is a difference. So the health humanities um, are distinct from the medical humanities in that they, you know, they involve disciplines of the arts and humanities, but there's a commitment to social justice. And they also incorporate the points of views of caregivers, other members of the healthcare team, and patients, so sort of an inherently um, inclusive discipline. And so they involve principles of the social sciences, social medicine, and health policy, along with arts and humanities, to go beyond the point of view of the physician alone, so that you're having interdisciplinary dialogue about health and not just disease, um, because we all know that medicine is only a minor contributor to health as a whole. So the health humanities create space for critical reflection, but also for understanding of systemic context. So it's a great way to see both the forest and the trees, um, to think about our individual experiences in healthcare as they relate to health equity, but also understand the broader socio-cultural contexts of health that contribute to inequities in health. Um, so why specifically health equity through the health humanities? So oftentimes I think when we're talking about health equity, there are a lot of abstract concepts that our learners um, may have difficulty contextualizing to their clinical practice or may not have lived experience with to be able to sort of either empathize or understand. And so through the humanities, whether that's perspectives shared by specific works of art or literature or perspectives that are shared through discussion, we can contextualize these sort of abstract concepts for learners. And then through self-reflection and sharing of perspectives, uh, the health humanities also help us recognize our personal complicity, um, potentially in furthering inequity, but also our personal responsibility in enhancing equity. And because of the broader context and the disciplines that we just talked about that fall into the umbrella of the humanities, um, we can also explore the systemic contributors to health equity. And as a discipline, as we mentioned, the health humanities don't privilege one voice over the other. The physician's authority does not supersede that of the physical therapist or the patient. You know, all voices are considered equally. So as I mentioned, it's sort of an inherently equitable discipline to start to generate these conversations around equity. So now I'll just spend a couple minutes telling you about uh, two specific approaches within the humanities that we use really frequently. Um, one of these is visual thinking strategies. So this is a structured framework for uh, looking at works of art to encourage open discussions of visual art and foster critical thinking. Um, it was developed over three decades ago by a museum educator and a cognitive psychologist. It's actually the most widely used museum-based method in medical education. And um, it's been used not just in medical education, but in museums and for a whole host of other learners, all the way from pre-K to you know, adults. So, um, it consists of three evidence-based questions that are asked repeatedly over the course of the process to really keep uh, the participants looking closely and holding them in inquiry as well. And there's a neutral facilitator whose job is to kind of paraphrase and build upon people's comments and link them together. And from the evidence that exists on the use of visual thinking strategies in both health professions learners and learners in other domains, there's impacts on multiple skills um, including observation, but also empathy, appreciating different perspectives, um, being tolerant of um, new ideas, examining one's biases, 
all of which are things I think we would agree are relevant to thinking about health equity. And sort of the second pillar that we've used in our work is narrative medicine, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with. Um, but essentially it involves engaging with creative works, often written to develop close attention. There's reflective writing to sort of explore personal narratives and then you share that writing to strengthen relationships within a group. And it's been shown that this sort of closed reading can facilitate listening and empathy, and importantly, advocacy um, for patients and colleagues alike. And narrative medicine um, aims to allow learners to develop narrative competence, which is defined as the ability to acknowledge, absorb, interpret, and again, importantly, act on the stories um, and experiences of others. So with that, I'll pass it over to Nate to tell you about what we've been doing at our institution. So with these considerations in mind, we decided to try to operationalize these concepts by developing a curriculum in our own institution. And so we formed the Health Humanities at Hakus EM, which is otherwise known as H3EM. Um, it's a multidisciplinary initiative that um, really encourages our learners to engage in scholarship, innovation, and um, education around issues of social justice, health equity, social emergency medicine. And it really aims to provide our practitioners with the skills that they're going to need to be um, better patient advocates, better colleagues, and really um, yield the, the, the total skill set that we need to have as, as um, emergency physicians to um, affect change in terms of health equity. So we have a longitudinal curriculum that's embedded within our, our weekly residency didactics. Over the course of a year, we have about eight sessions, um, which are mandatory because they're part of the re residency didactics. They're grounded in narrative medicine and the visual thinking strategies that you just heard about uh, a few seconds ago. And we developed them with, with, with um, input from multiple stakeholders, including nurses, patient and family advisory council members, as well as folks who have been sort of uh, leaders in this field. And we use a mixture of didactic and reflective exercises that incorporate art, history, and other humanities-based disciplines, alongside evidence-based medicine. And I think what we, what we do really well is we partner with other healthcare team members, um, community members and other folks who can actually bring these concepts to life. And so they can speak to it from a different um, level than, than we may be used to. We began in 2018 where we uh, just had some pilot sessions to try to figure out how it worked and whether or not it would be uh, uh, feasible and acceptable um, by our residents. And then we did our first full year in 2019 where we focused on the social determinants of health and the role in facilitating health equity. We had a the following year, we had a focus on anti-racism and developed a full curriculum that's um, on a website called sharetools.org. It's free. You guys can log in and get all sorts of uh, ideas about how you can teach these concepts to, you, to your own learners. Um, and then this current year, we're focusing on vulnerable populations. And so we have this theme of health equity that kind of uh, uh, it's woven through all the different years of the curriculum. Uh, but for the purpose of this talk, we're just going to focus specifically on the 2019 and 2020 year. So for that year, we had four objectives. The first is to encourage critical thinking about the social terms of health and emergency medicine and their role in achieving health equity. We also wanted to foster meaningful engagement with our patients, their families, and communities, and really promote self-reflection in the clinical practice. You know, too often we are just focused on getting the job done, getting those patients disposed, and, and figuring out you know, how to just be efficient. Um, but we're not really thinking about what's happening to us in that process, so we really wanted our, our learners to reflect on that. We also wanted to encourage knowledge translation into of, of the social terms of health into patient care, um, and ultimately to foster greater engagement with one another and with the humanities. So as mentioned earlier, we use a multidisciplinary approach to facilitating these conversations. On a session that was focused on generating impact and concern for um, individuals who are struggling with addiction, we actually partnered with our peer recovery coaches, who are uh, individuals with a lived history of, of substance use um, who are now in recovery. And we actually partnered with them to teach the session. So they taught us about what it's like to, to, to struggle with addiction and what it's like to fail and get back up and, and the sort of pathways to recovery. Um, and then we partnered that with um, some art-based exercises where we examined different aspects of addiction um, as depicted in art and then also showed different artworks from different um, artists that struggle with addiction as well. We also know that the current state of affairs in terms of health equity didn't just start today, right? Those things have their vestiges and things that have happened many, many decades ago. And so we really sought to really explore um, the history of medicine, reflect on all the times that we didn't rise to those highest principles that we aspire to. 
And um, with the idea that if we can critique those things, we can start to understand what we're doing now that's going to get looked upon in a ret retrospective scope as negative in the future, right? And so we can start to interrupt these negative um, um, uh, practices moving forward. We also felt that it was important for our learners to connect with the communities and try to expand the walls of our hospital outside that of um, the traditional classroom walls. And so we took our residents out into the community, did a mural arts tour, the, with the goal of really getting them to experience the built environment, see where our patients walk and live and play, and really get a different understanding of the complexities that they sort of face on a day-to-day -day basis. You know, many of us aren't from Baltimore. Many of us have, have no sort of lived experience that, that, that the patients have. And so really sort of trying to replicate that as much as possible, getting people to understand um, some of the difficulties people face, I think has been really eye-opening. It's really encouraged um, some of our learners to in further engage in community efforts. We also had a session that was focused on health literacy, in which you combine an activity that focused on um, having residents articulate complex medical diagnosis within a 60 second elevator pitch. And then also have them describe really complex pieces of art as well within that sort of 60 second elevator pitch. But the goal of really trying to figure out how we can sharpen our patient centered communication skills and really figure out how we can communicate these complex medical diagnoses without the use of jargon, right? And so these things are really going to be critical if we're going to figure out how we're going to reach out and meet the needs of our patients who oftentimes don't understand some of the complex things we're trying to articulate to them. So in addition to our uh, resident didactic series, we also host a humanism speaker series. So biannually, we invite speakers, whether they're physicians or scholars or activists who work on the confluence of social forces and health to come and speak and engage with us. Um, here is just a sampling of some of the folks that we've had engaged, um, including uh, Dr. Dennis Shea and Dr. Shamsher Samer from UCLA who talked to us about incarcerated populations. Uh, we also had Latoya Ruby Fraser, who's a renowned photographer and activist, who um, came and, sp and speak to us about using photography as, as, a, as a modality for social change. Uh, we're actually going to have a session in June um, that's going to be virtual. Um, and uh, John Lewis, who is at Emory, is going to come speak to us about the use of uh, hip hop as a modality to help um, uh, address health literacy issues with patients. So we also want our residents to be able to translate their knowledge into action. And so we actually developed the Health and uh, Humanities Innovation Award grant. And you might see some of the winners here in the audience today. Um, some current projects include uh, um, helping individuals who are moving in, uh, back into society from the carceral system um, identify whatever their gaps to, to care might be. Um, developing uh, health equity-based simulation material for medical students um, who are part of our core clerkship, as well as developing a humanities uh, conference to try to engage multiple stakeholders who are in this space and want to figure out how we can use these tools to, to better affect change. Um, so now that you've seen a few snapshots or examples of the activities that we've offered as part of our curriculum, uh, we want to pivot a little bit and tell you about the PRISM model, which might um, allow or facilitate the adaptation of some of these ideas to your specific context and your specific um, learners. So um, as I mentioned, the AAMC had commissioned this large scoping review, and um, from the evidence that they saw, so from that literature review, as well as through expert consensus, um, they actually identified four core functions of the arts and humanities in medical education, as well as in health professions education more broadly. So the four core functions they identified were the mastery of skills or knowledge, uh, the sharing and understanding of others' perspectives, personal insight and self-reflection, and as we mentioned, um, social advocacy and critical thinking as well. So um, with the PRISM model, they suggest that this model can be applied to break down a topic um, through each of those lenses to understand how the humanities can be adapted um, to teach that topic. And so the model is really designed to help educators align educational strategies and objectives when they're integrating arts and humanities. Um, so uh, essentially, we're not, you know, we're not going to go through each of these steps, but they ask you to think about, you know, what, who your learners are, what the learning activities might be. But importantly, they also ask you to consider institutional environment and culture, and what barriers you might face within your department or institution or community um, to really establishing an effective curriculum. And finally, as I mentioned, um, they also want us to think about the benefits and limitations. So we won't go through the whole model because there's a fabulous paper on that. Um, but we'd like to share with you how you could conceptualize health equity as a topic to be taught through the humanities through each of these lenses from the PRISM model 
and we'll use our curriculum as an example. Um, so when it comes to specific skills that might be critical to mastering in equitable healthcare, um, the ones that we focused on developing in our curriculum are observation skills, improved written and verbal communication skills, um, studying the history of medicine to be aware of the historical contexts of care and how that impacts care today, um, and as well as enhancing interprofessional teamwork skills, uh, which we focus on through a lot of our collaborative art and literature-based discussions, as well as developing empathy itself um, as a skill that we can facilitate. Now when we think about perspective taking and thinking about this as health equity, moving towards health equity requires us to be able to take and share perspectives, including understanding what others think of health equity and learning the barriers that they, um, they might face in navigating healthcare or that they might face as healthcare professionals. Um, so our residents experience different perspectives through reading literature, through viewing art. Perspectives are also shared from non-physician colleagues and patients as we just talked about. Um, and importantly, residents get to hear each other's perspectives on important topics to start to develop a shared language and culture around the topic of health equity. We also encourage learners to develop their own personal insights around health equity. Um, so we use varied strategies, including narrative reflection, art-based discussion, visual thinking strategies, to sort of um, engage in deep introspection and develop personal insights on our own barriers to health equity um, and ways in which we can advance health equity and start to think about personal biases, start to think about cultural humility as a personal attribute, um, and even how residents might respond to the, the numerous traumas that they experience at work, especially working in the setting um, that we work in. And then finally, thinking about health equity as a social construct and thinking about it within the broader social context as well. Uh, we created opportunities for community engagement. We create opportunities for direct advocacy and intervention for research and scholarship, as well as a framework for our residents to be able to critique current structures of power um, through experiential engagement uh, in our speaker series with artists and activists. So with this prison model in mind, we want to share with you some of the results from our own evaluation of our um, curriculum for that year. Our curriculum was well received by the um, majority of our residents with over 90% of them feeling that our sections were good or excellent and wanting more of that incorporated within their residency didactics. And about 88% of them felt that the sessions really helped them to incorporate the social terms of health into the health care plans of their patients and to partner better with patients and families to facilitate those care plans. So this really speaks to that mastery of skills um, element of the PRISM model. Additionally, close to 90% of the, of the uh, residents felt safe expressing uh, differing opinions within the group and they valued the opportunity to not only express themselves, but also hear the, pers the perspective of others, which really speaks to that perspective um, sharing piece. And then almost all the residents felt that the curriculum helped them to think about biases in patient care and to be better advocates for their patients, which speaks to that personal insight and social advocacy domains of the prison model. Um, here are some illustrative quotes from the free text responses and an evaluation of um, our um, residents. And these re relate to the impact of the curriculum and them personally. Um, one of the residents stated that um, hearing these sort of um, sessions really made them start to focus more on the patient and the patient stories as opposed to just getting the historical details so they can identify whatever the pathophysiology is, right? So really going with that human first approach. Additionally, it helps them to better empathize with patients and to be able to reflect um, on their own biases that they might have. And ultimately, it helped them to feel less alone and encourage them to read more and question more and, and be curious, right? And we've all went through some pretty challenging years over the last couple of years. And the ability to, to have something that helps you feel more connected with people when you can't even be in the same room with somebody, I think is really important. So in, in addition to the sort of impacts on, on them as individuals, there are also some impacts that they felt um, occurred to their uh, a clinical practice, one being that they started to interrupt those biases in real time. They would sort of feel a bias coming up and start questioning themselves and think about what implications this is going to have for the patient's uh, long-term care moving forward. It also helped them to advocate for patients. And also, they really start to really explore that social context and really figure out how they can incorporate that into the care plans for patients. So you're creating these inclusive care plans that are reflective of the patient's reality as opposed to just some theoretical thing that we come up with sitting at the, at the computer, not, not sort of thinking about um, all the sort of complexities that the patients might face. So in addition to the, to the freeze text responses and the uh, evaluation survey, we actually conducted a focus group uh, with our uh, learners to also get a better understanding of why this worked, 
what are the things that sort of made it work and what are the sort of um, impacts that it's had on our department. And there are three overarching uh, themes from the focus group that arose. First, the, the learners felt that the health and humanities curricula were essential and that they should be prioritized and integrated within the system. And then by in creating space for it within the resi didactics, it actually showed that it's on par with all the other stuff that we think is valuable for them, right? We have limited teaching hours, and so if we're actually putting this stuff in there, it's, it's, it's highlighting the import of it um, and, uh, and, and, and legitimized it. Additionally, they felt that the healthy humanities were transformative, not only, them from, not only for them as individuals, but also for the departmental culture, and we'll sort of do a little bit of a deeper dive into some of the sub-themes that came out of that in a, in a second. And ultimately, they felt like the health humanities helped them to, to reflect, process, and validate the humanities themselves, others, and other patients. And as we sort of think about how we can build resilience and uh, against burnout and all the other kind of um, challenges that we face, we think this was a really important insight. Uh, but we just wanted to dive a little bit deeper into this sort of idea of transformational um, culture, which I think is really important when you're thinking about how you're going to have long-term um, sustainability and long-term change and growth within an organization. Um, what we found is that there are four things that they um, noticed. One is they, they felt that they had improved relationships with their non-physician colleagues. So the fact that the peer recovery coaches shared their stories and were, served as their teachers normalized that relationship, right? It, it leveled those hierarchies. The fact that we have interpreter services come and teach us lessons, right? It, it changes those relationships and that ultimately helps to change your department. Additionally, there was increased um, uh, positive regard for stigmatized patient populations as, as they were able to see the humanism in each and every one of our patients and better understand the complexity of the struggles that got them to those situations to begin with. Additionally, the learners felt that they had a better understanding of the social context and were figuring out how to incorporate that into, incorporating patients and patients' families into the sort of healthcare team as partners and, you know, really sort of re, restores that sort of patient-physician um, relationship, which is really important. And ultimately, um, they felt that there was a greater awareness of racism, systemic inequity, and that these things became the norm that we talked about, right? We talked about issues of equity and how we can be, be better for our patients and be better advocates, and that became the, the norm in the conversations that we were having. And so um, we felt like it's, it's had a, a, a tremendous impact on, on the way that um, our department functions. So um, we'd like to spend sort of the last few moments um, of the, this didactic um, giving you an opportunity to think about how you might be able to translate some of this to your own learners because this is definitely something anyone can do. Uh, one of the barriers that comes up or one of the concerns that educators sometimes have is, well, I don't have any expertise in art or literature or, um, or I have art and literature expertise but I've never talked about health disparities, I've not facilitated conversations around anti-racism. Some of the other things that come up for us are people feel like they don't belong to a group that has a right to talk about it, or they don't want to put people in a position where um, they feel obligated to talk about things or put a minority tax on their colleagues uh, who may be able to speak to some of their lived experiences with the issues that we want to talk about. But I think what we really want to highlight is that this is an opportunity for partnership. Um, you know, so there's over 60 medical schools that have uh, partnerships formally with art museums in the surrounding cities. So the museum educator partners for you to work with are out there. Um, there has been a sharp increase in the number of medical and health humanities undergraduate majors and minors. So there's plenty of educators um, outside of the medical institution that are there for you to draw on. And more and more medical schools these days actually have centers for medical humanities or health humanities. So there are a lot of resources out there. And we'd really encourage you to look both within the walls of your institution, but get outside the walls of your institution. Think about community organizers, activists, local artists. There's a lot of people with expertise to bring to the table. Um, and so this is, again, a really exciting opportunity for collaboration and partnership and development if there are areas that you, know, you don't feel as comfortable with. And there's also a lot of online resources, including formal training in visual thinking strategies, formal training in narrative medicine, um, the AAMC actually has a really cool getting started guide um, that walks you through a lot of different, uh, different activities. And then again, as Nate mentioned, uh, we also just put up a set of resources on share tools, which we'll show you briefly at the end. So before we kind of dive into this activity, um, we just want to highlight a really, really crucial role that arts and humanities play in education. And that's the role of art as a third thing. So. Uh, Liz Goffberg and her colleagues described the third thing as essentially a work of art or some other kind of visual object or image or even something written down 
that serves as a reflective trigger or conversational mediator that creates a safer space for sharing perspectives. So in her research on this amongst medical trainees and healthcare professionals, uh, Dr. Goffberg describes how a direct confrontation with a deep truth can be frightening, blinding, um, but a third thing opens an avenue for indirection. So a participant moves from exploring the third thing or talking about that work of art, and they can kind of talk about their personal revelations around that work of art um, or around that topic. But if those revelations become too painful, then they can just pivot right back um, to talking about the third thing. We actually saw this in action two weeks ago where um, we had used a really provocative image uh, with a group of pathology faculty to discuss the image. And um, clearly there were some very clear themes in the image about power and oppression. And people were uncomfortable. And so, you know, there was a picture, there was a dog in the picture. So when we asked them what's going on in this picture, someone goes, there's a dog, thank you very much. You know, so it gives people an opportunity to kind of ease into the conversation, right? Um, focus on the work of art, and then the conversation will slowly build towards having, you know, talking about the themes that you're looking to explore. Um, so, uh, Goffberg also describes how uh, looking, at, looking at art as a third thing can help explore and uncover assumptions and biases, um, how it can deepen relationships within a group that's working together, um, clarify the values of a group that's working together, and then this is the most important part, and I think we've talked about this a bunch, is flattening hierarchies, right? Um, so a really great example is the AHRQ commissioned a conference on patient safety, and they actually use the concept of art as a third thing. So in a room, they put up works of art, and they had patients, family members, healthcare professionals, physicians, and other allied health professionals walk around the room and choose a work of art um, that kind of spoke to their experiences with an adverse patient event. Then this super heterogeneous group had an opportunity to have a conversation as equals um, about what they had experienced with patient safety events. And so there wasn't, you know, sort of this traditional medical hierarchy. There wasn't the traditional doctor-patient authority differential. Um, so people could just feel empowered to share because they were talking about that work of art. And I, I think it brings everybody sort of to the same level because as we said right at the beginning, this is not about having any, any expertise in art. So that traditional like power differential or knowledge differential between learner and educator disappears entirely. Um, so keeping this in mind, now we'd like you to sort of spend a little bit of time thinking about how you could adapt certain ideas or images to your learners. So um, you'll have an opportunity to look at these more closely, but we're, this is an image um, by Latoya Ruby Frazier, who um, is a MacArthur Genius Award winner and one of our speakers that we had come last year. Um, and this is a collage that she created and that's used in one of her TED Talks. And so we like, you know, we're going to have you look at this image and also read this poem that's actually written by a physician called Reasons for Admission Not Indexed in ICD-10. So we'd like to give you guys a few moments if you, I would like if you guys can tell we're like really into QR codes. Um, if you pull up this QR code, you'll be able to see both the image and the poem. And we'd like you to just take a couple minutes on your own. Um, to look at this image closely, read this poem, and kind of note down what sort of feelings or thoughts um, or ideas jump into your head, how you might be able to find some parallels between the two. And then if you feel up to it, please share your thoughts, you know, either below the image or the poem um, to kind of so that we can generate some dialogue. So we'll, we'll spend a couple minutes doing this and then come back to the group.
So we'll take about one more minute and then we'll discuss. Looks like we have a couple, uh, a few responses now. Uh, anybody like to share their thoughts about the connection between the poem and the photo? So again, no right or wrong answers. And I know the session's being recorded, but they told me that if you speak from the audience and you're not in front of a mic, it won't get recorded. <laughs> so <laughs> feel, feel free to say whatever you like. <laughs> So I'm curious to why you mentioned the word broken. I'm just curious to like, what did you see or, or read that made you feel that way? Yeah. Well, I mean, the image on the right is obviously something that seems to be really broken um, and kind of collapsing and falling apart. And I feel like the posture in the other picture is just sort of one of someone who is not at their best potentially. Mm -hmm. It's hard to see what exactly is happening. Yeah, so you're kind of getting at like visible deterioration, visible suffering, um, and then with the poem, kind of getting at what's under the surface that we don't we don't always see. Thank you. Um, yes. Absolutely right. I, in a sense, there's a lot of discouraging imagery, like we just talked about. But you, as you mentioned, even if we can't fix the system, there are individual ways of of improving someone's experience in a way. And you're describing just so that just as there's these sort of unconventional reasons for presenting, there's unconventional treatments that we can offer them that are not admission or imaging, but just changing the way we treat them, changing the resources we offer to them. Yeah, great point. Um, oh, we're almost out of time. So. Um, we were going to say talk to your neighbor, but like if you talk to your neighbor, I'll probably hear you, so you may as well just tell us. <laughs> um, but you know, in the last minute, you know, if this is a bigger question and maybe something to ponder when you're home, um, but if you wanted to include this image, this poem, or pair them together for your learners, whoever that group might be, um, it might be interesting to start to think about what kind of topics you would want to steer them towards, what themes you might be able to cover. Um, and also interesting thing about how you could frame this within the PRISM model. Are there skills you want people to gain from looking at this image? Are there perspectives, do you want to pr have them practice perspective sharing with each other on the basis of this poem? So it's a lot of different ways you can operationalize just these two simple works of art. Um, but just in the last minute, does anyone anticipate sort of any pitfalls um, with using this image or poem with your learners?
Yeah, and that's and that's a great point. And we've kind of been alluding to this is that there's a sense of discomfort and and maybe just like resignation that could be raised by looking at this. So you might want to be proactive and think about, okay, well, how am I going to pair this with another activity that forces people to be proactive or forces them to make that discomfort into something productive? So it's also important, you know, to think about sort of what the limitations of this might be um, and anticipate how you're going to address that for your learner group. I think we just have a minute left, so we'll... Uh, I'll the other thing I'll say about that, I think it's also important to emphasize to them that there's like a hundred different things that are listed in that poem, right? But each person can work on one thing, right? Find what's your jam and make that your, your thing that you do to try to make things better for somebody on a day-to-day -day basis. So you can always flip it to make it something positive for them. Um, so just in the final moments, so the website that we mentioned, uh, it's not specifically health equity focused, but we're looking at anti-racism sort of within that umbrella. And we've um, developed nine different modules as well, well as a facilitator's preparation guide and a whole lot of resources for um, educators and facilitators to kind of further their awareness around anti-racism. And then the modules go through uh, a really clear step-by-step -step process for covering different themes. It includes the works of art you can use and it pairs it with evidence-based literature that you can use on that topic. Uh, and this is freely available at sharetools.org. Um, to access the actual full module, um, you have to just make an account, but that's just so that we can track sort of who's using it and what they're using it for. But again, it's freely available. And with that, we will wrap up and we'll be happy to take any questions that people might have. Thank you for sharing and thank you for your attention. Yeah, definitely. I mean, and I think that like betrays our own bias or our own like comfort, right? Um, so those are the things that we were more comfortable with. And then when we transitioned to doing things virtually, that was sort of the easiest. Um, but there's definitely literature out there, especially in psychiatry, on the use of like music and Broadway musicals to get people to talk about like stigmatized populations um, in psychiatry. And then also getting people to participate through like medical improv um, or participating in music, in the creation of music. Um, and sort of not just having the sort of that passive role, although being an observer is also very active depending on how you frame it. Um, but there's ways, there's also literature out there in actually getting learners um, involved in creative activities as well. And that's actually one of the points of feedback our learners have given us that they want to hear other types of modalities. And so you know, we've been trying to think about how we can incorporate hip hop or other kind of things that are more local to our, our um, institution that um, can still have a big impact. To mention, um, our local opera is premiering a piece this summer based on uh, Oliver Sacks' Awakenings. So we're going as a group to watch that and see what people come up with for their experience. That's awesome. Very cool. Yes. So do you see like this, um, this curriculum is focused on um, investigating and um, you know, just helping bolster it? perspectives and attitudes, behavior when it, when it comes to a broad range of topics as they relate to health equity, um, which I think is, is wonderful, I think we all need. Uh, to me, I think of it as um, maybe like a first step, um, especially for interns coming through residency and, and thinking about um, kind of patient outcomes, right? And, and how we're gonna use a curriculum like this, I think to sensitize with the residents as they, as they come through. Um, or to have meaningful conversations with, um, with patients and families, I think, you know, and especially in the community, um, about you know, social risk and talking about social risk. So, so my question is, um, has this curriculum been used with, to help leverage um, you know, some efforts around, let's say, like social risk screening in the emergency department um, as like a first step? Or, yeah, oftentimes the conversations we have like lead to actual um, initiatives within the department. Um, so, and oftentimes they're very resident-led. Um, and so we had a conversation on uh, what resources exist for patients who are undomiciled or don't have stable housing, and that was taught by one of our social workers in conjunction. 
Um, and I think our residents are working on like a guideline that's going to go in our EMR around those resources and topics. So, um, and you mentioned interns, but our our residents participate from intern year all the way through their fourth year. Um, and initially, we thought, okay, this is just going to kind of work on communication and then getting people to talk. But I think the depth of conversation that you get when you have learners and faculty of multiple levels of these conversations is really, really important as well. But yeah, we've definitely seen clinical initiatives come out of these conversations. And then there's, a, there's another initiative where, you know, Dr. Bahar runs a, 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 a graduate level um, uh, uh, longitudinal experience that, that teaches some of these principles to, to resident learners from multiple disciplines. And they're, we're looking at the impact of um, these curricula on their decision making in certain sort of charts um, uh, situations. So we're trying to move beyond just the sort of personal impacts on the learners to also trying to understand like how you can sort of move the needle in terms of the way people perceive, you know, bias and stuff in, cl in, in clinical. Um, yeah, we're using we're using simulation to, to assess that right now. Thank you all.